Hi everyone. This week's question deals with uh, who are some of the people that really helped us in our stages of coaching. Now for me, my very first coach was a guy called Tony Checker. Um, actually ended up being my very first mentor for coaching. He, he remained a good mentor for me throughout my, all my athletic career, but basically when I went into coaching, he was one person whose approach I actually really admired and, and, and appreciated. So we stayed engaged in a, in a mentor sort of role for, for quite some time and still to this day um, chat quite regularly. One of the things that he helped me with most was the questioning that he uh, had towards what I was doing. So um, I really appreciate this because in, in many roles, people want to tell you what they think you should do or how you should do something or use their experience to say, well, you should do what I did here and the rest of it. Whereas with Tony, it was quite different. Tony would basically... Um, we'd be talking about what I was going to do, what I hoped to do, and then he would start saying, okay, well, have you thought about it this way or that way? And basically have me questioning what I was doing, which sounds like a bit of an odd way of approaching things, but for me, really gave me validity as to what I'm doing. He would uh, cause me to, to question my own practices. And, and in turn, I mean, if I answered it with, with confidence, then I had good faith in what I was doing in my approach. If I struggled to justify or offer valid reasoning, then that would be something I'd have to address and go back to, to look at and see if we could improve on, on that approach. And Tony was certainly a, a great role model for me in all of this. He's also um, a school teacher and his methodical approach to everything he was super organised, had um, had a real planning sort of aspect to, to the way he approached things and that really influenced the way I do things. And likewise, uh, many of the teachers that I worked with um, as a school teacher had that same influence on me. We, we planned curriculum, we had outcomes we needed to meet um, and, and, and we planned appropriately towards those. Uh, in coaching, I feel the same, same thing is, is relevant. Some of my other mentors, uh, first of all, was a guy called Richard Huggins. Richard was a, was a, well, he still is a fantastic coach, but probably slowed down his coaching these days. But someone who was just a great guy, um, I respected him immensely. He was fantastic with sharing his knowledge and resources. Um, but ultimately, what really sparked my interest in, in a guy like Richard and why I wanted him involved in my coaching career was because he was someone who seemed to have a really good um, understanding of people, um, really good relationships with coaches, athletes and the likes. Um, and from him, uh, you know, I've got a lot of strength in my, um, in my approach to how I do some of those things. Uh, it's without doubt that uh, the relationships that we form with our athletes are, is integral to going forward and Richard was someone who showed me definitely the light of how to go about this. I've had some great uh, role models in past coaches. Uh, another one I'll point out is a guy called Sean Crichton. Sean was an amazing runner in his own right um, and took on coaching me in my final years of athletics. But Sean really gave me confidence in what I was doing with my training programs. Uh, gave me confidence because it aligned similarly to what he had done with me and what had obviously worked for him at a high level. So that that's that's invaluable as a coach to have the confidence in the training that you're prescribing. Uh, within my work with Athletes Australia, I definitely highlight two people, Nikki Frey and Craig Hilliard. Craig's experience uh, speaks for itself, but ultimately Craig's um, uh, experience with working in things in the moment uh, on on race day uh, within a major championship is just a, a huge strength for me to have uh, someone supporting me in that role. And Nikki Frey is just amazing as someone to, to have an ear of someone to chat to uh, when there's a few difficult times um, and she always seems to have the right things to say. I think having people like that around you is invaluable also. So hopefully uh, you'll go on search for your own mentors and people who influence your coaching. Um, certainly these people have been uh, crucial to my development. Thanks. I'm Bye. excited to talk about this. This is actually like my fifth take because the other ones have gone over like 10 minutes. Uh, I usually get asked this question in interviews, but it's like, you know, you get a snippet. So uh, I'll try to ramble through this pretty quickly, because, uh, but I do think it's important. Uh, the first group of mobile models I had before I got into coaching and uh, it would be my friends. Um, you know, they collectively, like the common thread amongst those guys are uh, how how hard they worked then it was it was school and running now it's their careers and their families and their friendships and uh, the other part about them uh, was they didn't take themselves that seriously and John Marcus talked about this last week I do think that he that that syncs up with humility uh, 
you know, when we were younger, that was like unprofessionalism or being irreverent. And, but now, you know, it's just like, it, it, to me, the, that means it's authenticity and that, you know, the real, they're not putting on a face, a uh, fake face or fake mask when you're around them. As I moved on a little bit, when I, right when I first got my job, uh, well, when I first started coaching was grad school, I actually had, I got really fortunate where uh, Del Hessel, who's now retired at Colorado State, he just, he was at the last two years of his career, and uh, he's like, hey, you're motivated, you wanna do this, you get all the non-scholarship athletes uh, in middle distance. And so that, at 23, like, that's a pretty huge deal. Um, I was stoked to do it. Uh, but. Dr. Hickey was one of my advisors there, um, and he, the thing about him that stuck with me was just how he earned, earned, earned our respect, and when you have a position of power, it's really easy to abuse that. He was a like, complete opposite of that. Um, he actually blended his faith seamlessly uh, into what he was doing at work, and that wasn't like a preachy thing, and it wasn't uncomfortable, but he just carried himself and, and demanded so much out of himself and he treated us with so much respect that we, after a while, you're just like really, I just looked up to him. And I, I like that because it had, it built a lot high level of trust and that's very important for athletics as well. And then as I've, you know, I'm in the position I'm in now, just a couple of years into a bigger group and this is my full-time job coaching, um, though I've been coaching for, you know, a little over 10 years, but now it would say it would be our support staff and that, that might sound corny and cliche and I'd like I'm, I'm not giving them a shout out at all um but it they really are the the models that have a big imprint on what i do uh you know we have a physiologist cory hart and kyle faffenbach you might even we talk about him before uh, Beck behringer is a pt kevin rendell who's, who's a, a chiropractor ashwan rao who's a, a sports medicine doctor and then Dan Paff, who's a coach, and Stu McMillan. That, that, that group is, that's who I talk to, that's who I work with. And um, it wasn't by coincidence that I tried to find those people that are like my friends, but just happen to work in this world. Um, I mean, they're super, you, if you're fortunate enough to meet any of those guys, uh, you, you're you going to like them and respect them immediately. Uh, they, they keep growing. I mean, they're right at the top of their fields, and they... They keep getting better. Again, it's that humility. Uh, they're authentic. You just, you know, you know about them right away. They're not trying to uh, be manipulative or just put on some show. I mean, they, they're good at what they do and they know it. And they also have a lot of joy with their work. And so with the athletes that I have work with now, I mean, the money's on the line. They get ranked daily. I mean, think of like a really stressful job, like a, a surgeon or a CEO. They don't get ranked. They don't go and compete against each other in their profession. And I, I think a lot of people uh, who who work normal jobs that aren't athletes, like, they forget about how they always like, oh man, it'd be great to just go run a couple hours a day. And I'm like, yeah, it'd be great to exercise for your job, but you don't know what it feels like to to be a failure by point zero seven seconds. And you don't know what it feels like to get hurt uh, like a week before your biggest race. And it's not even the money that, that really hurts the athletes, it's just that they didn't reach their goals. And so, from my position, I just by default, I work in an area of growth. I haven't yet signed an Olympic champion out of college. They, they haven't existed um, since I've been taking this job. So if they come here, a lot of them want to be the best. And so by default, like, they have to improve and they have to grow. And because it's so stressful and there's so much on the line and they push themselves physically and mentally to the max, that there, there's a lot of vulnerability there. And so I think of like the authenticity I think about taking my, like I want my athletes to know that I take my job very seriously and I'm gonna hit the metrics I need to hit. Uh, I'm gonna be attentive to them. Uh, I wanna earn their respect, hopefully. Sometimes it, sometimes it might not happen. Um, but at, le you know, at least there's, there's hopefully the trust that's there. And if I'm real around them and I have nothing to prove, I just wanna you know, be the best support role I can in their career then I think it's going to set them up well. And if the people that I've been fortunate to be around over the last, you know, 20 years of being someone in this sport, if they are cool with me and they're okay and they keep teaching me and I keep modeling myself after them, then the athletes that I get uh, a chance to work with are going to be in a really good spot. All right. Time to give the people what they want. Question two. Influences, mentors, and role models. So first, let me give thanks. My mentors have been a gift priceless beyond rubies and gold. So to everyone and anyone who has taken the time to
talk with me, taking the time to, you know, relate some experience. Thank you. It means a lot. Um, my number one mentor and my number one role model and the influence is my high school coach. Quick aside, high school coaches, you have the most important role and privilege of any coach out there. You get to capture the hearts and minds of that young distance runner and show them, hey, you could be really good at something like this. And you get to nurture and you get to create that culture and that self-identity. And oh my gosh, I miss coaching high school for that reason so much. Because at no other time is such a young man or woman as open to the teachings as you're offering and open to exploring the possibility of what they could do through the vehicle of distance running and competing. Gosh, it's a gift. <laughs> I miss it. But back on track, Coach Kendig, Dan Kendig at Franklin High School, he had the life-changing impact. Meeting him changed the course and trajectory of my life forever. So I am forever humbled and thanks to having intersected with him when I did in the late 1990s at Franklin High School. Fast forwarding to my contemporary mentors who are still practicing, uh, Rob Connor, obviously, University of Portland, good friend, good mentor. I talk to him weekly, not so much about necessarily training and coaching, but more just about life, checking in and having a good time. And yeah, we bounce some ideas back us, back off of him and between us, but he is a bell worth of wisdom. It's great to see at this recording, University of Portland men ranked number three in the country in NCAA cross country for division one. Um, again, I've been so blessed to intersect and interact with giants and just sit at their feet. Jerry Schumacher and Alberto Salazar both let me just show up to their practices for a lot of the mid two thousands and just watch them coach, watch these Olympians and world-class athletes get ready to go um, achieve what is now the Renaissance of American distance running. I didn't know what I was watching when I was watching it, but now I know. Phenomenal, phenomenal gift. Um, Vin Lanana, obviously a giant in the field of middle distance running in America. Gracious mentor, dear friend, I can't thank him enough for having taken under my wing, or excuse me, having taken me under his wing <laughs> and teaching me so much. So, again, just because they're famous names doesn't mean, you know, uh, the mentors that other people have had aren't as valuable. I've just been blessed and I'm so thankful for it. Uh, you know, influences are my colleagues, are, you know, Steve Magnus, Danny Mackey, Mike Smith at NEU, um, Drew Wartenberg, Ian Dobson, the list goes on and on and on, Ben Rosario. These are all great guys, you know, Lauren Fleshman and women who are coaching at a high level who like, yeah, I intersect with and engage with here and there at meets or, you know, Andrew Castor is another one that comes to mind as I'm bumbling through this. But man, there's such a rich community ready to share. And all you got to do, Ricky Sues down at Altus, I mean, Dan Path, uh, Vern Gambetta, Stu McMillan, you know, the list is go, names go on and on. I'm sure I've omitted a bunch of people who deserve credit. Peter Thompson's another one is coming to mind now. Um, but if you can follow my train of thought, it's a rich community, man. Just be ready to ask questions, be inquisitive, be quiet, listen, and observe, and just passionate about what you do. And when other experienced master coaches see that passion and enthusiasm, they know who the next generation that is going to um, succeed them is, and they want to help nurture that. So I'm so thankful for all those men and women who continue to be sources of learning, information, and insight. Um, you know, now, let me shift to my books. As you know, I like to read. So I'm going to go through a bunch of books here about influence me in chronological order. So when I was in high school and before I became a coach, the number one book, Once a Runner, must read. I mean, it. I've read it 15 times. It sets the tone for what the culture, what the loneliness of the long distance runners and the trials of miles. Close second, free. Yeah, this is an original copy. It's worth getting. Tom Jordan's book captures the spirit of an artist and a creator that set the world on fire and continues to do so. I can't tell you how many times I read and read and reread. It's one of those books I pick up every year and read again and again and over and over and over because it just keeps 
the the spirit and the fuel and that fire going. The you know third in that holy trinity of high school books I read was of course Running with the Buffaloes. Chris Lear does a phenomenal job encapsulating and um, biographing what a season of collegiate cross country can look like at the highest level and what a band of brothers coming together looks like through adversity, death. I mean, you name it, they overcame it. Phenomenal book. As I started to move away from being indoctrinated into the culture of American distance running, becoming and I definitely as an athlete and now more as a coach, I started to look, of course, being from Oregon to the big dogs, you know, Kenny Moore and Bob Williams, who are University of Oregon athletes, obviously were able to give me a hint into the mind and um, of Bowerman. And I mean, this book here, Bowerman, the men of Oregon, phenomenal, must read, must read it again, shows a pioneer who's making a map from nowhere and something to aspire to. Bill Bowerman sets the tone for what a college coach could be and what it should be, not necessarily what it is right now, but what it could and should be, and that spirit is alive and well. Another phenomenal, very hard to find book is this old Coaching and Care of Athletes by F. A. M. Webster. British chap, I suggest you pick it up, written in the 1920s, one of the first, as you can see, long form books about how to coach and care for athletes from a holistic standpoint, not just X's and O's. This is before science and physiology. This was like, how do we move people to believe in themselves? Phenomenal book on training, sports psychology, and historical record of methods of that era. Of course, Run, Run, Run by Fred Wilt. Phenomenal, must read in the canon. Absolutely, get yourself an original copy like this. You know because you can see the little guy in the back. It is by all means. Training with Sarity. This is another book, one of the first in the many Sarity books. I'm a big Sarity believer. He had the spirit of what a coach, philosopher, um, partnership, pioneer, innovator is. Like, oh, every, I mean, currently being rereading a lot of Sarity classics because they've gone into reprint. Phenomenal. To stay down under, Ron Clark's The Unforgiving Minute with Jerry Lindgren on the front cover there you must read. If you can't get your hands on a copy, call me. I'll let you borrow mine. I mean, I've lent it out so many times. It's, it's, it really encapsulates the spirit of what it's like to be a beast that Ron Clark, rest in peace, was setting world record week after week, year after year, over and over and over again. The fact that Emil Zapik gave him a gold medal, one of his own, speaks volumes about the type of competitor and the place Ron had in the history of and lore of distance running training and theory and application and racing. Another must read is, of course, the great Joe V. Hill's Road to the Top. Insightful, brilliant. Another totem, Train Hard, Win Easy, The Kenya Way by Toby. This was the most sought out book for a long time. They only made so many and to get this original copy, man, you, you had to extract a pound of flesh from someone. It was one of the first books that gave us an insight into globally how the Kenyans were training and preparing for international competition. And then finally, one of my favorites by Peyton Jordan with Jim Ryan on the cover, Champions in the Making. Again, another great book, insightful read and deep dive into the psychology of preparing high level athletes and dealing with all the soft skills that come into play when you're coaching a person in real place and time. So. Those are a lot of my key influences and mentors. You know, I guess the role models for coaching for me were always the men I was never able to meet uh, who have sadly passed on, you know, to the next uh, portal in life, you know, an afterlife, if you want to call it that. Uh, the Bill Bowermans himself, Arthur Lydiard's, Sarity in person, you know, Igloy, like those are all men I wish I had a chance to sit down and converse with. I'm so thankful to have spoken with uh, Revento Canova in person. It's been a blessing to be able to extract that value. So there you go. Long answer, but hopefully worth it. And you got a lot of value. I have a litany of books available to educate and nourish your coaching journey. Until next question, I'm out. All right. 
Today's topic on mentors and role models is one of my favorite topics. It's because it's not often discussed, but I wouldn't be here as a coach if it wasn't for the people who showed and guided me in the way. And it started all the way back in high school when I began running. Like I had a group of really good high school coaches who taught me valuable lessons that helped me as a runner, but then almost like planted the seeds to help me from as a coach. You know, one of my first high school coach, Mike Deldano, he pulled me aside one day my freshman year of uh, running cross country and track, and he said, Steve, do you want to be really good? And I said, yeah, of course I do. And he goes, okay, you got to run on the weekends. And at that point, it was entirely foreign concept. And I was like, oh, okay, coach, I'll do it, but why? He said, Steve, you don't know what this means, but in three years, you could break four for a mile. And I had no idea at that time. And he was almost, uh, almost completely accurate in, in that one, and it's scary to think about that. Um, but what I was doing was planting the motivation seed and planting the seed of, hey, this isn't just a sport you do, this is an activity, this is a devotion, this is like a life. And by planting that seed, he got me researching on running and understanding like the history of runners. And he'd come in and he'd tell me about Prefontaine or Frank Shorter. And then other times, I remember we sat down for um, an hour in, in uh, class or our, our fitness PE class and we watched the Olympic 1500 finals from when they were first filmed until the, you know, I think the 96 uh, Olympics at that time. And everyone, we watched them all. And it was things like that that got me hooked on the sport. And he taught me very valuably that like, it wasn't just the training that we were doing, but you really had to get someone hooked up. And then my sophomore year in high school, a new coach took over, Gerald Stewart. And Coach Stewart taught me more about life and running than, than possibly anybody. And it was amazing at that time because it, it worked out almost perfectly in the sense that he came in as a very knowledgeable sprint coach and jumps coach, he'd coach national champions and you know guys who ran 10.2 for the 100 fully automatic and high school and uh, phenomenal triple jumpers over 50 feet in high school and all these things, but he never coached cross country. And I remember my sophomore year, he came in and he said, Steve, I've never done this, but I'm gonna go all in on it. And he went to every clinic, he went to every good coach in, in Texas essentially and picked their brains and figured out what they were doing. And when things didn't go right, when I didn't run up to expectations, when I didn't succeed or PR as much as I thought I should, he said he, he would sit me down and say, don't worry, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to learn more. I know you're putting in the effort. And as a sophomore in high school, I remember being struck by that. Because here I am, I ran poorly. Right, I, I did that at the state cross country meet or the regional cross country meet. And here's this man who's much older, much wiser, and he comes up to me and he doesn't blame me. He's, he just says, you put in the effort, I'm gonna do my part to make sure everything is good. And that lesson as a coach is something that I reflect on all the time now. Because I sit there and if someone runs poorly, the reaction as a coach is to always blame them. And so if anything bad happens in life, the reaction is to blame external things. And what Coach Stewart taught me in that moment is like, first always look inward. Always think and look, what did I not do right for this person? And that lesson has carried me through more mishaps as a coach than anything else. And it's extremely valuable. Another thing that was really interesting about Coach Stewart is he, he would treat you as a peer. You know, I was a 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kid trying to figure this out. But he'd sit there and say, hey Steve, what do you think about this workout? What do you think about this? And he'd let me explore. I'd say, hey coach, I really think I can handle 80 miles a week. 
and it'd be like, all right, Steve, let's try it. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. But he, he gave me guidance, yet at the same time the freedom to explore what worked and how I wanted to experience the sport. And again, that's another lesson that I've, I've it has become a staple in my own coaching philosophy, is that coaching is a partnership. And regardless of the age, like you have to have the, you have to give the athletes the freedom and the autonomy to understand and explore themselves. The next stage in my coaching development probably happened when I met Tom Teles. He was a famous, you know, world-class coach, Coach Carl Lewis, Leroy Burrell, you know, coaches on our staff at Houston. Um, dozens of world-class performance performers, Olympic medalists, etc. And I learned so many things from Tom, Coach T, and about half of them were technical on how to coach and half of them were about life. And I think that's like the overarching method or message for this coaching mentorship thing is that it's not just about the X's and O's, it's about they teach you about life. And Coach T like went through the mechanics of athletics left and right. He made me try different events on track. He, he made me learn how to start out of starting blocks and all this different thing. And at the time I remember thinking like, I'm a distance runner, man, why does this matter? And Coach T knew one off, he said, you're gonna be a coach someday. He told my parents that, not me. <laughs> and then, the second thing is he was like, you gotta appreciate everything. He's like, I can teach you how to race walk. He's like, I don't, I don't coach race walkers, but I can teach you how to, But because I, I spent the time, invested the time to understand it so that I understood everything. And from a coaching standpoint, that was it. He, he's, it, it was take the time to understand every aspect of sport, of athletics, because it crosses domains. And I'll never forget, he'd sit there and when we'd be at practice at a high school or college and you know some pro or post collegiate uh, you know team sport would would be practicing or something like that and he'd go over and he'd walk over and say hey this is how you actually throw a football you need to do this this and this you know he'd tell me stories about how he corrected the, the NFL teams on oh no your linemen your feet need to do this when you move not this and he, he didn't coach those things but he knew movement was movement and he knew enough was enough Right, And it's like having that large breadth of knowledge was the overwhelming coaching thing that, that Coach Teles taught me. There was one time when he pulled me aside and he said, Steve, the, the secret to coaching is reading. I said, okay. He said, you need to read everything you can. And at first, some of it won't make sense. But after a while, you've developed this filter and then you're gonna read, read a book or an article and within the first you know, paragraph, you're gonna know this guy knows what he's talking about or this guy doesn't. He said, you have to develop that filter. And to do so, you need to read to develop that knowledge BS filter. And then from a coaching standpoint, you need to observe and watch. All events, all meets, everything. Observe and watch so you can refine that coach's eye. And from, lastly, from a coaching standpoint, I remember him pulling me aside when we would work out together and we'd be working on running mechanics and he'd always ask me how that one felt. Now here's the guru on running mechanics and he didn't come in and he didn't say your right shin angle needs to do this, your right arm needs to do this. He always started with how did that feel? And it took me a while to learn this, but what he was trying to get across is that running mechanics, yes, he had a model of what was correct in his head. But more important than that was how it felt. He was trying to ingrain a feeling of it, of a smoothness of the stride, of an understanding of how to change gears, because he knew it was the perception and the feeling that mattered and that you would go back to in the race. You wouldn't sit there and be like, oh, my arm is only at 90 degrees or it's crossing over and it needs to be this way. It was the feeling that it was after because he knew that was long term. And then I guess from there, as, my, as I grew as an athlete, 
and started getting into coaching, my mentors actually became more of my peers in a sense. And that I started to explore my own coaching philosophy through conversations with fellow runners who were interested in this. So one of my best friends, Andy Stover, um, I think part of my coaching development was spent on runs while we were in college together, like sorting through training and talking our way through training. And it's during those, you know, 10, 10 mile runs or two hour long runs that we just sort through training ideas and things that we'd read. And like that was our own processing mechanism. And, and that continued through, you know, post collegiately when I was running with guys like Mo Joseph, like, Mo and I laugh, but my, my book, my first one, which is this book right here was written almost partially through conversations with Mo because I was going through grad school and I'd explain things to him and then he'd tell me things he thought were interesting and we'd go back and forth until I had these ideas conceptualized. So mentors don't all only have to be those older and wiser. They can also be people who help guide you along through things, who are your peers who help you sort ideas through it. And as we've reached, you know, I guess my middle age of coaching now, it's colleagues and friends have, have filled those gaps. And it's the people who I can call up and ring, like, you know, the people on this whole segment, John, Danny, and Adam, who I say, hey, like, I screwed this guy up. What do you do? What do you think I should do? And I think when I look at how mentors and role models have influenced my coaching, it's been more important than any of the standardized education, my undergrad, my master's, et cetera. Way more important than that, right? And I have mentors in those fields too, like Jason Winchester, an exercise physiologist, and a couple others. And it's been more, in, Mentors have been more important than any single, you know, formalized um, education component. So I really stress to young coaches is find people who want to help. So thanks again for listening to episode two of Coaching with Craft. If you enjoyed it, hit subscribe so that you don't miss out. And uh, please share with fellow uh, athletes, runners, coaches. It really helps.